which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, end up in worse condition than he did, but uh, and I didn't really know about all this going on. <laughs> so, um, but uh, proud to have all these guys and the two gals on the end out this year, and uh, they really helped develop our team. That's about it, I guess. Thank you much. Congratulations.
We were able to give them one of the biggest upsets. Um, they, we gave them their only loss of the season, which was a pretty big honor. We beat them. We've beaten them for the past three years. Um, we earned the title of Team of the Week on WIS Sports, which was also pretty cool um, to get that honor. Um, also, we beat the River Falls Wildcats for our second year in a pretty big cross or pretty big rivalry. So. It was a great season, um, and we look forward to building on it next year. And um, yeah, that's about it for football. Um, next on the list is girls golf. Um, I don't believe we have any representatives here, so uh, I'll just go ahead and say how their season went. Um, their coaches are uh, Jackie Gunderson, and the assistant coach was Ed Rankin. Uh, Cassie Worm, uh, she is a junior. She was named the second time BRC um, Player of the Year. And uh, she went to state individually and she placed eighth. It was her second time at state and uh, she did very well. The girls uh, golf team had quite a season of rebuilding after losing three seniors last year. But um, there was a lot of progress and there's a lot of promise for the next season. And um, it was a very good, very good season for them and Cassie Worm was named all-conference first team. So it was a very productive season for the girls golf. Give a hand for them. <laughs> uh, next we have the boys soccer team, uh, coached by Coach Bublitz. And we have Chris Berglund and uh, JC Tantalian to talk about their season. All right, uh, I'm Chris Berglund, one of your co-captains for the 2010 season. I'm JC Tuntlian, another captain. Um, this year you, was kind of a building sorry, year for our team. Gentlemen, can you just come a little closer to the microphone? That yep. way we can pick it up for taping a sure little thing. bit better. Okay. Thanks. All right. Uh, this year was kind of a building season. Um, we lost a total of about 11 seniors last year, most of which were starters. Um, so we had to take in quite a few freshmen and quite a few sophomores this year. So, um, But overall, most of the games that we did have, we were right, right, right there in it and uh, right there to the end of the fight. So it was... It was a productive year, but uh, our uh, record didn't obviously show that. So, no, we um, this year was more chemistry than skill. We made a lot of good friends. I mean, like last year wasn't good chemistry. We had our own little clicks and, clicks and stuff. So, I don't think that was our downfall. But this year was really good. We connected with freshmen, sophomores, juniors, which usually <laughs> seniors don't. You know, not really big, but we made a lot of good friends, a lot of good people. We had fun on the bus ride at home. Sometimes got in trouble, but you know. It was, it's kids having fun, not big trouble. And um, yeah, we didn't do as good as we wanted to, but we set high goals for ourselves and uh, we tried our hardest, so. I'd say probably the highlight of our season is uh, losing only one nothing to Brookfield East down in Brookfield. Um, they were number one in Wisconsin the entire year, so. Yeah, that was good. Nice. Yeah, that's it. All right, next up we have the girls swimming and diving team, uh, coached by Dick Clark and Katie Zappa and Kelly Hackbarth. And we have three uh, swimmers and divers to talk about their season. Let's go ham. Um, hi, I'm Amanda Baker and I'm a diver. And we had a really good a season. A little closer to the microphone, Amanda. <laughs> we had a really a good A little closer. <laughs> <laughs> we had a really good season this year. We had a winning season with six and three, and we got third in conference. I'm Kendall Tierney. I'm a sophomore and a diver, and we placed eighth in our sectional meet. And I'm Hannah Van Valkenberg, and I'm a senior, and I'm a swimmer. And we had Amanda Baker going to state also. Um, and we also had a bunch of people placing in conference and sectionals too. So it was a good season for us. It was awesome. So. All righty. Next up, we have the girls tennis team coached by uh, Dave Dahl. And we have two state uh, qualifiers and competitors to talk about their season. 
Hi, I'm Morgan Karras. Um, I was a captain this year for the girls' tennis, and we had um, a winning record of 19 and 6, and that put us in second place for conference this year. Um, Whitney can talk about state. Um, at state, uh, we had two teams go, both of us, which are the number one doubles team, and our number two doubles team also went. And overall, we placed in the sorry, <laughs> we placed in the top 16 teams of, at state out of like 400 teams throughout Wisconsin in Division One, which was awesome. We never thought we'd get that far, but it was so satisfying, like our senior year. And then the two juniors, Casey Fall and Jenny Fastbinder, they top. They placed in the top 32, and hopefully they'll be back next year to improve. So it's been a great season. Congratulations. <laughs> All righty, and next we have the girls' volleyball team. Um, we have Ashley Fall and Amber Sadoff to talk about their season. Hi, I'm Ashley Fall, and I'm a captain of the volleyball team. I'm Amber Sadoff. The volleyball team was coached by my father, Dennis Sadoff, and assistant coach coached by Pete Galuska. The varsity volleyball team had a successful season, even though we were two and four, the record in the conference. We finished the season with 21 and 11 overall and took first in our home tournament and first in the Northwestern tournament. We finished our season with a loss in the regional final against Eau Claire North, and they were seated number one in our conference. Um, it was a, a fun season. The girls played hard and had a good result for the show. And our Eau Claire North game summed up our whole season. We actually beat. We played till four games. Um, it was a battle. Every single point. Um, what was the last game? It was like within two points each game. And we actually ended up winning a game out of five, which was awesome. And that just showed. And we had four girls on the bench that were hurt. <laughs> Right before practice, we had a girl who like tore her ACL the practice before. So we had to build together and finish the season off with a good note. That's it. Congratulations. <laughs> All right, that wraps it up for uh, fall sports, and uh, we look forward to um, our winter sports getting to go or getting going. I know uh, boys hockey are starting trials this week, as well as a bunch of other teams are uh, getting ready to go, and uh, we look forward to seeing you at the next meeting. Thank you very much. Ben, thank you for your job as a student athletic ambassador. Nicely done. Okay, Sandy, high school musical. <clears throat> All right. Hello, Dolly is the high school musical this fall, and they are currently in dress rehearsal, and we're going to try to be here. So if we can be a little flexible, I don't know. I don't uh, see anyone here yet. I will say dates, though, so just in case they're not able to get away, November 12th, 13th, 14th, and the 19th, 20th, and 21st are the show dates. Friday and Saturday, the show begins at 7, and Sunday at 2, and we encourage everyone to attend. And where can you buy tickets, Sandy? The box office is open. I don't know the hours off the top of my head, but the box open office is open, I believe, in the mornings and then from like 3 to 7 in the evenings, Monday through Friday. Okay. Well, we'll move on, Sandy, and if they show up, um, perhaps we can slide them back into the agenda. But if we could move on to the superintendent's report. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm going to first start with... Um, uh, I feel very good to be able to tell you that the district um, has received the Energy Star Leader Award from the Environmental Protection Agency. And this is really an award for improving our energy efficiency by 10%. Um, that was over the, a year, and it started with a baseline in 2008, and then it was the, the school year of 2009, or moving into 2009. That savings, uh, for that energy reduction was approximately $135,000. And so as we look at that towards the future, certainly that saves our taxpayers that, um, those funds over time. And that $135,000 in the energy that we're talking about um, can be compared to reducing greenhouse gas emissions by more than 1,500 metric tons per year. Now that may not mean a lot to most of us sitting up here, um, but the equivalent of that is planting more than 350 acres of trees. 
So pretty significant uh, for the district. And this commitment began, you'll remember, back when the board accepted uh, Lieutenant Governor Barbara Lawton's energy challenge uh, to reduce our energy consumption by 10%. And then the board hired the energy management service at um, no additional cost, it comes out of the savings, to really create for us a comprehensive energy management plan. And as we moved forward with our new energy managers from CESA 10, um, the phase one of that plan was really to do an in-depth assessment of our buildings and their operations and their energy efficiency and look for where we could um, save. This effort, we need to give credit to Jim Stayskull, who led this effort, to our custodians, who worked very diligently in our buildings to um, help create this energy savings, and then to our financial service director, Tim Erickson, who was in charge of the entire effort. Um, as we think about um, how that occurred, I also want to give credit to our technology coordinator, Nancy Toll who um, also looked at her department and um, made some very significant changes that reduced the energy consumption um, from all of the technology that we use throughout the district. The phase two, um, once we made sure that all of our um, HVAC systems were operating um, at high efficiency, was to um, help educate our, uh, the staff members about what each of us could do to help save energy. And so that was the next phase. We had energy reductions um, plans in each of the buildings, and that was really um, actions that staff could take to do that. We did things like reducing the number, reducing or eliminating the number of individual plug-ins, and really went to, um, say a coffee pot that didn't, isn't in one classroom, but serves a, a group of classrooms. So those kind of changes. We also looked at um, lights. If you leave a, a building or a room, certainly the lights, we are better at turning those lights off now at this point. And also making a decision about do we need the lights? You know, if it's a room that has um, good lighting, need to make a decision about how much light we actually need. Uh, there were places where we went from one switch in a room to two switches so that you could actually um, use less of the lighting in the room. And um, those kind of accommodations or modifications have really created uh, this energy um, reduction for us. You know, the district continues to raise the bar in our um, for ourselves about our goals for energy usage. And we continue to um, move forward with higher expectations than just a 10% reduction. So we'll be looking at that in the future. Um, we, as we become better consumers of energy, we also model this for our students. And we think of our HSD 2025 Graduate Learner Outcome and Environmental Sustainability. Um, that's one of the things that we want for our students as well, to be good consumers of energy um, for the future. So we hope that what we learned, we can communicate to our students and they can carry it home to their families and uh, we can make a, a huge impact in how much energy we use saving our environment and our natural resources as well. So congratulations to the board for the commitment and to our staff who have um, worked very diligently and been really stepped up to this commitment and taken it on. Um, you know the work of our R3 committee, our Reduce, Reuse, Recycle committee and what they've uh, moved forward. And um, I'd like to have uh, Tim Erickson, Director of Financial Services, present the award to President Barb Van Lunen.
Thanks, Tim, for your leadership in that, certainly. Um, it's a district-wide effort, and it starts with leadership. Any other questions or comments um, from the board? Okay. I do think it's a, it's a great piece of work, and um, congratulations really to the district for all the work that, and effort that's gone into that. Um, I think it, not only it, it allows us to say that we're being good uh, stewards of the environment, but we are really modeling something that we want our students to learn as well, so thank you. All right, um, uh, Mayor, if you want to continue with the next item under superintendent's report. Certainly. Um, this item is on the number of Hudson administrators. From time to time, I get asked about the number of administrators that we've added over time and what that looks like. So I thought it would be important for us to bring that to a board meeting and share that information. And um, in comparison, we're really starting with looking at the year 2005, 2006, and comparing that all the way through to 2010-11, the current school year. Over that same period of time, just to put it in perspective, um, we have added 576 more students. We have 66.5 more staff full-time equivalents, and I'll talk about what that is in a few minutes. We've added one more elementary school, um, a district office, and um, one more administrator from 2005-06 to 2010-11 uh, during that six-year period. Diane, if you would turn then to the second page that we have, um, where the graphs and the charts start. <clears throat> I'll talk from that. And I'd like to start with uh, chart number one. And this chart shows the number of Hudson students per administrator compared to the state average. So if we look at 2005-06, um, the number of administrators we have in the district, and, we're, and for administrators, we're talking about um, superintendent, the directors, the associate directors, the principals at each building, and the associate principals. I hope I didn't miss anybody. Kept, catch me if I did. So in 5-6, uh, we had 18 administrators on staff. And then over that six-year time period, you can see from the numbers that it has fluctuated with a low of 17 and um, a high of 20 administrators. And when we get to the current year, we have 19 administrators. And I see us continuing with 19 administrators into the future. Um, I, at, at least at the present time, I don't see a need to add unless our numbers of students in the building, say at the middle school or the high school, would get to a point where, where that was needed uh, f to support their uh, work. So I think we're really at the uh, number that we need to do the work in the district presently. And then if we look at um, the students, again, we've had 576 additional students. So if you compare the number of administrators and the number of students, the number of students per administrator has gone up over that six-year period. It is higher. Um, it started in 2005-06, again, with 275.2 students per each administrator. And then this year, that has risen to 291 students per administrator if we look across the district. Um, comparing that to the state average, and you might notice right away when you look at the column with the state average that there are no numbers for 2009-10 uh, and 10-11, and that's because uh, we, the state average doesn't keep up current day. They're usually about two years behind, and so we don't have that data um, to show you. So uh, we just, uh, stop, it stops at 2008-9, but we continued on with our own, our own data over that time. But if you look at the numbers um, in 2008-09 and compare it to how many students per administrator in Hudson, we're well above the state average. And then looking up at the chart itself, or the uh, graph one itself, you can see the blue line is really the number of students per administrator, and I, I really just want to point out, don't get confused and think that's the number of administrators in the district. That's above the state average. It is the number of students per administrator, and you can see that that number for all of these years has been above the state average, and then uh, the red line being the state average. 
If we move on to the, um, let's go to chart two then, Diane. That is the number of staff FTE, comparing that um, staff per administrator. Now, full-time equivalent, uh, 1.0, means that's a full-time person. And it, uh, actually, it's not a full-time person, it's a full-time position. And the note says it can often represent more than one employee, so let me talk about what that means. So we know what we're talking about when we talk about FTEs. A teacher is a full-time um, equivalent, so it's 1.0. Now we have many people in the district that are part-time people. And so they add up to um, a, a portion of an FTE or a full FTE when we add multiple people. Some people are in multiple roles. So they may have um, a role in one building and a role in another building and a role in another building. And each of those pieces adds up to get the FTE, the total FTE across the district. So for example, if we took our crossing guards, and we looked at the full year and their um, work, they, in FTE, they would be 0 .087. So you can see it would take quite a few crossing guards to be a 1.0. So, um, and if we took a, an educational assistant who was working three hours in the district during the school year, that would be a 0 .305 FTE. So um, one FTE, sometimes represents a person, one person, and oftentimes it does not, particularly when we get to support staff. It's multiple people that it, they often represent. Um, I have to just uh, put a qualifier on this as we look at the data. You know, we have, um, with new systems coming in place and so forth, um, our system of tracking staff for 2010-11 is sophisticated. When we look at 2005-06, it served us at that time, but it is not at the same level of sophistication. So it's much harder for us to look at that data and get data out of those numbers as we can with 10-11. And um, so we are, um, we wanted to really translate this into people instead of FTE, but we really don't have the ability to do that without an enormous amount of um, staff hours to actually count and make sure we're not um, duplicating and so forth. So we did go to the FTE, which becomes much more confusing. But what I can tell you from this, and looking at that chart, you can see 2005-06, and then um, comparing it to 2010-11, that the number of staff FTE per administrator has gone up. Now, if you just look at those numbers themselves, it doesn't look significant. But when you think about how many people it represents, then it starts to be very significant. So um, our best estimate of um, as close as we could get, and we know this isn't exact, um, that's at least 100 more people uh, over that time period. It may be more, and it's very likely to be more. But um, just thinking about that, you know that those FTEs uh, equal more people, and we have more uh, people that uh, administrators would supervise and evaluate during that time period. On the, the next page, um, we list each of the administrators. I told you the groups that um, we talked about, and I'd be happy to take any questions that you have. I guess I have one last thing to say. You know, we're, we're at a time where um, our students are learning at higher levels. Um, this is being led by our administrators. Um, and we have more students per administrator. And I think that that's one thing we just need to recognize, that the work of our administrators, we've changed the work of our administrators. And we have higher expectations for that work um, if we look back to 2005, 2006. And yet we have more students uh, per administrator as we're growing as a district. Madam President, I'd be happy to answer questions. Are there questions from the board? I, yeah, I guess, uh, Madam President, a, a couple of comments, I guess, more than questions. Um, first, um, I want to say that I recognize the importance of, of our administration in our, in our school system. And we have, we have a strong administrative team. I don't, I don't know everybody very well, 
but I can certainly say that I know the people at this table very well. And for the folks at this table, they're some of the most capable and hardest working people I've ever had the pleasure of working with. Uh, and I have no reason to doubt that that doesn't carry through our whole system. Um, having said that, just I want to add a couple of comments. Uh, one is while I know we've only added one administrator over this, this five year period, um, I think we should acknowledge that there have been some additional administrative positions that have, are now in place to support the administrators. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there is that, that you know, backdrop that I think that has to be put into, into context. While there may only be one additional administrator, there have been administrative positions added um, as needed. And the ones that we've added ha have been necessary. And uh, um, as I recall, by and large, I've supported them. So I just want to make, make note of that. Um, by way of comparisons, and, and you've probably heard me say this before, um, but I've spent 25 years <clears throat> in large government bureaucracies, and they're not models of efficiency. And so <laughs> when, when I see comparisons to where we may be with our school districts, I do not, that, that is not for me a compelling argument that we are understaffed with respect to administration. Um, it, it, it may be the case, but I'm certainly not gonna accept that on its, on its face. Uh, um, I think there's probably a lot of inefficiencies out there. We may be the ones that they should be pointing at as far as administrative structure goes. Um, but once again, um, I want to finish like I started. Um, I think we have a strong administrative team. I support the members. They do great work, and I am behind them 100%. Could I, could I respond to that, please? Um, I appreciate you recognizing the work of the administrators, and um, I just want to go back to, I, I want to address your comment about um, we're understaffed because I, I don't agree. I don't think so either. Um, as I said in the beginning, I think the 19 administrators we have um, are the right number to do the work that we have in the district, even though the expectations are higher, even though the results that we're achieving with our students are higher. Um, I do believe we're right where we need to be. The only reason I give the comparison information is it's really hard for us to um, you know, understand, well, okay, so many students per administrator, what does that mean? So again, um, I, I'd endorse your comments as well. I would say that I think um, we've worked very hard at efficiency in the district, and and because we have not as, we have more students per administrator, we have to be more efficient. Any other questions? I, I would like to add just one comment. I'd really amplify what you said, Mark, um, which is I do think that first of all, I appreciate the work that. Um, Mary, you and the team did in pulling this together because I'm undoubtedly we've all been asked the question What about the administrator uh, administrative structure at the district offices? And so this is very helpful as background information. I think for all of us on the board um, and um, While I love your comment about is that the right benchmark for us to be looking at? Um, I have a different benchmark um, doing this work professionally and having done it for um, several decades in large and small organizations, I have a different data point that I can compare to the size of the structure at our uh, district offices and, and can say, um, in my experience, we are um, running a very lean ship and, the, and, and this group is doing an amazing amount of work, whether we're talking about people at the manager level or at the administrator level based on my professional experience doing finance and HR work, which is a lot of what gets done in the, um, in the service center, so thank you to the administrators for the work that you are doing. Okay, um, we are now into reports and the first item on the agenda in that section is the educational cost per student, um, Tim and Sandy. Okay, I'll start off. Um, if you look at the, uh, the chart that's been put together, this is information that uh, DPI compiles each year and uh, we've chosen uh, to look at high-performing districts and uh, these are the ones that uh, Sandy refers to in her reports when we're looking at uh, uh, student performance um, and the, the top section is sorted by membership and I just want to make a comment on membership membership units here in this report refer to um, our aided membership that's how we calc how the state calculates aid for us based on the student numbers so there are things that are added in that make this number different from some of our other numbers for students uh, in that uh, summer schools added in that makes a, a fairly large impact of over about over 100 units um, and then we've got some other differences but uh, I just want to make that note that there are differences in, in that uh, number uh, for the membership 
Uh, Madam President, could I just add on to that? So what Tim's talking about um, that's important for us to just point out is the report that you just heard, if you would look at the enrollment numbers and compare them right here, they would be different because they are not the same as Tim uh, talked about. There are more in this number than the enrollment numbers. That's right. So uh, with, with that said, um, if we look at, look at the membership section, performing districts and this is a 2008-2009 data that's the latest year that's available and uh, Hudson is in this uh, instance ranked number two in size uh, in number of students uh, compared to those 10 districts and then what we've done is we've uh, we've pulled out the data on uh, what's called total educational cost per member and so it's total educational cost per per student really and what that includes is the cost of the, the district's general fund, uh, special education, and debt service. So you add all of those costs together, and uh, then you divide by your number of uh, student membership uh, units. And in this particular example, when you look at the, the information for 0809, uh, you can see even though we ranked uh, second in membership, uh, the uh, cost per member for Hudson is 10,657, so its rank is number 10. And you can see Elmbrook at the top with uh, $12,745 per member, and you can see all of the other, uh, other all of the other districts in between. Uh, if we go and compare ourselves again, taking the same information, comparing ourselves to the Big Rivers Conference, uh, you can see it's sort of by membership. Uh, Hudson ranks second at 5,471 members, and then sorted again by the total educational cost per member in that second uh, box down below, Hudson is ranked number five. So again, uh, when we look at, uh, you know, certainly efficiency and overall costs of, of educating our students. And uh, so with that, I'll hand it over to Sandy. Thank you. I made uh, contacts with all the districts on the high performing side, on the left side there, seeking information on just initiatives they have currently going on, systems that they're putting in place, you know, what is it that you do to be a high performing district? And out of that analysis came pretty much three patterns that, that were coming out pretty clear. One, I can confidently say Hudson is on the right path. Um, I found similar work being done in all of those high-performing districts. They are working to implement a systems approach to improving student learning. That was, that was loud and clear. Two, they are focused on the work that we're doing, but it's been for a longer period of time. So it appears that the things that we're doing, we, it, you know, in a two, three years, you know, there'll even be more impact. They've been at it longer than we have. It also appeared, too, that you found that the leadership had been consistent. So at the superintendent level, the superintendents had been there for a longer period of time working on that systems approach, and or people within the system kind of moved up through the system. So again, there was consistency throughout their upper administration. And then number three, I also found that they have more learning support positions at both the district and the school level. So some examples would be, if we start with some of the initiatives of the high-performing districts, districts that they have in place that are very similar to us, one that I asked questions about was advanced placement, because we're working very hard to get more students involved in advanced placement. And currently, Hudson has 12 advanced placement courses. The range of AP courses in those districts that I contacted was from a low of seven to a high of 20 AP courses with the median being 14. So we're not far from there, and you, as you know, almost every year we're coming at least with one more AP course. So again, they've been at that longer, we're not far behind. Another area I investigated was PLTW, the Project Lead the Way, the pre-engineering course. Again, we are in our second year of implementation, just one quarter into that second year. Menominee Falls began P PLTW in 2006. So that means they've been at it five years, and they also have it at the middle school level. Kettle Moraine has also had the high school and middle school PLTW program for five years. Franklin Public already has three courses in place. Whitefish Bay started in 2008, so it's been three years. And Mequon Thienesville plans to start their fourth course at the high school next year. So again, similar program, just been added a longer time. Um, during the process, as I was talking to many of the districts, 
They also mentioned other initiatives that were currently in place that I just wanted to mention. Things like, um, well, all these initiatives show evidence again of starting out perhaps at the elementary, rolling up, or at the middle level, rolling up, but again, that time factor is very important. Um, the other piece is that they're very similar to what we're doing, and here's some of the examples, like hiring, a focus being hiring the best teachers. That was consistent. Uh, balanced assessment initiatives going on, a rigorous evaluation system, collaboration time, balanced literacy, and then also beginning the pre-ACT assessments that we're also investigating currently. The next area I investigated then was just the learning support positions that support the work that's going on. And again, if we look at what Hudson currently has, we have one reading specialist at five of our elementaries, and then our smallest school, Holton, we have a .6. We also have some reading and math assistants, but not certified teachers. We have a 1.5 reading specialist at the middle school, and then you are aware too that we have 2.5 literacy coaches, so that's kind of what we have here. At Cedarburg, they have two full-time reading specialists at two of their elementary schools, the larger one, and 1.5 at their smaller school. They also have a .45 FTE instructional coach who works solely with new teachers. Whitefish Bay has approximately two reading and math support teachers in each building. Elmbrook has a reading and math specialist at every school. And then Menominee Falls has 5.4 FTE curriculum support specialist for their four elementary and one middle school. And then a halftime coach at the middle and the high school. So just a little comparison for us to see what kinds of positions other districts have in place. At the district level, you find a variety of positions, but some that are unique that we don't currently have. Cedarburg, Cedarburg has a district assessment and data analysis leader, that's an administrative position, an assessment coordinator, and two district diagnosticians, again, data people. Elmbrook has an assistant superintendent of educational services, but that person is supported with a director of assessment and a director of curriculum. So again, as you know, Tim and I were doing our data, what came out is we're on the right path. Very similar programs going on. They've been at it longer, but really working at our systems approach is exactly what we need to do. Mary? Um, uh, Sandy, one of the things I thought we talked about, but I'm not sure, I didn't think I heard, heard but um, correct me, is strong emphasis on professional development as well. Correct, that would have been one of the initiatives. Thank you. Brian? A couple of questions. Uh, first of all, appreciate the, uh, that was uh, pretty interesting calling up those other districts and doing some, uh, doing some investigative, re uh, or just doing benchmarking. Uh, when you said rigorous evaluation, what did that mean? What, what does that mean, rigorous evaluation? Um, the evaluation process of, of their teachers, of their employees, as far as um, the system they put in place to ensure that they have quality going on in the classroom instructional. Mm -hmm. So what's the, uh, if it, after th four years, if the uh, evaluation doesn't go well, what, what's their uh, course of action? Uh, Brian, I didn't get into details, but yeah. just to know that, that it's exactly what we've done here. Our evaluation process the last few year, years has definitely changed and become more aligned with the work that we want yeah. to have happen. Uh, so, and just one other comment is, uh, I think it's good to have this data about uh, the spend per, uh, per member, um, but I'm strongly in the camp that uh, I think hopefully a lot of the school uh, board members agree with me is there's, I'm strongly in the camp where just spending more money does not necessarily equate to better results. So, mm -hmm. just want to be on record on that one. So. Any other comments? Questions? No? Okay, thank you. Um, and so now we are moving on to middle school addition construction update. Tim. Okay. Um, <clears throat> this will be more of a pictorial update uh, than I've done in the past because uh, over the past month we've had a lot of, uh, a lot of changes. The building's been really, the addition's been really moving along. And I want to thank Jim Stasekel. We went out and took some pictures of the project uh, yesterday. And um, so the, the first piece, just so that you can get acclimated to where things are, um, you can see the floor plan, uh, how it's laid out. And if you look directly to the north, you can see the existing, the existing elementary gym, Hudson Prairie gym, uh, the cafeteria. 
and then down to the left or on the west side the existing middle school cafeteria and then boiler pool room, pool and uh, some equipment rooms so those really surround the three walls of the addition and then uh, with the addition of, again we've got the orchestra classroom uh, the weight room fi slash fiad and the multi-purpose and so if we go to the pictures that first uh, the first photo uh, is really looking down uh, from the uh, from the pool wall, the southeast corner of the addition. And um, if we go to the next picture, I'm going to go through these relatively quickly. We've got quite a few pictures here. Uh, this is the east wall of the addition, and uh, this shows the existing window openings. And the next picture is the northeast exit of the addition. And then we've got the north exit hallways. And the multi-purpose room, and that's uh, the multi-purpose room is is the largest room in the addition, and that's about 30, 30 almost 3,500 square feet. And then we've got on the next photo, uh, we have the this is the orchestra room looking east, so looking out the uh, east end of that, uh, that's the piece that's not adjoined to the uh, to the rest of the buildings. And then we've got the uh, weight room, and the south hallway. Uh, the weight room slash PE is about 1,200 square feet. And then we've got on the next photo, we've got uh, the, the bearing walls. And those are, those are installed. And uh, the next point, the next large piece in this process is to uh, start to install the steel joists. And uh, the next piece, again, a bearing wall, showing the bearing walls installed and ready for those joists. And then we've got uh, a final set of pictures. We've got the, uh, a view looking down off the retaining wall, looking down towards, towards the storage area. And if you remember, we've got uh, about 1,600 square feet of storage uh, below grade on the building. And uh, then the next picture shows that we've got our base course uh, compacted, and that's, uh, that's about ready for pavement, and that's looking east of the addition. And then the final picture shows uh, what's called our borrow pit, and that was to excavate some materials, some good material that we took off site, and we excavated out uh, substandard material off the building site and just replaced the material from the borrow pit uh, to the building site and vice versa. And uh, we, saved, uh, we saved quite a bit of money doing that. So that's just a picture showing that, that pit, and that's about 90% restored right now. So. Any questions? Oh, and by the way, I'll just mention we're still uh, on budget and we're still uh, on schedule at this point. So, any questions? Dan. Thanks, Tim. That's a good report. A um, couple questions as I look at the orchestra area, the weight room being adjacent to each other. Um, I, I'm trying to recall if we've had a discussion about the sound, not only for the orchestra. I know from past projects that we've had, we've, you know, we've tried to be pretty sensitive about putting in, um, you know, so that there's no reverberation and yeah. that type of thing within those rooms. And yes, and it, there, yeah. okay. there, there's soundproofing in between there, so that we're okay. We're so if that. somebody's working out lifting weights, so we don't necessarily have that carrying over to some other room and vice versa. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. It depends if you're lifting. All those big weights there, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Madam President, Lynn, please. Tim, I'm wondering if you can speak to how the construction process has been as far as disruption to the classrooms or school or safety, how that's been as far as the experience for both the middle school and, and Prairie. Um, I, I, from my standpoint, it's gone, it's gone very well. We've, uh, you know, from a standpoint of safety, um, it, you know, we've really controlled the, the construction traffic in and out. Uh, we've also added uh, some additional temporary staffing uh, for, for noon time uh, for kids. And I know Mary uh, has also been out and talked uh, to staff, so she may, she may have something additional to add there. Um, you know, when we think about the accommodations that Hudson Prairie is making, certainly they have added, uh, or they have three classrooms meeting in uh, the building. 
and taking up space. And then when we think of safety, they have um, made a number of accommodations on their playground. But the place where they've made the most accommodations is really in Fayette. And Bill Shaw, Shaw who is the Fayette teacher, um, has, has had to uh, modify based on where he can, what uh, outside area he can use. Because um, the area that has been dug up is part of the playground that he uses for um, his classes. So that's changed. It's, it's different. He has a more limited area. We have some concern about um, not student safety per se, but you know the um, effect of, of the wear and tear on the grass that's in the area that's left because it's a smaller area and um, it has heavy usage. He, he isn't able to move from one place to another. So those are, are um, areas that are the most affected uh, because of it. There has been some sound issues, um, but basically they've been fairly minor in comparison to a construction uh, project, but when you have a jackhammer, you know, it's gonna be loud. And so I just really compliment Hudson Prairie staff and also the middle school staff, uh, particularly those in the wing that is adjacent to this building project uh, and their accommodations to make this work. So our staff has been, have been very flexible and accommodating and their first priority has been, as well as Hoffman's, keeping our children safe. So I, I commend them for um, their efforts to do that. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, moving on to topics for action. It looks like we aren't gonna get an update on the fall musical, Sandy. All right, so the first item under topics for action is um, in relationship to the state education convention, which uh, will occur in January. Um, we do need to appoint a delegate and an alternate to that convention. Um, I, I, I understand that we have two board members that are likely to attend the state convention. Um, Dan Chernohoy and Pat German, are, it, are any of the rest of us um, planning to attend the state convention? No? All right. Is there a volunteer? All right. So um, I, I would love to see a motion from the floor. Uh, we need to act on a, a delegate, um, and it sounds like Pat German would be an appropriate delegate, and Dan Chernohoy is an alternate to the state convention. Is there a motion? So moved. Motion by Mark. Second. Second by Lynn. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Congratulations, Pat. And thank you, Dan. All right, uh, consent agenda. Uh, if someone would read the language on the um, financial distributions and we will move approval of the consent agenda items. Uh, Madam President, I move to approve the consent items including uh, the Director of Financial Services be authorized to pay bills the amount of $1,955,831.48. Motion by Brian. Second. Second by Dean. Those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. We are now on to committee reports. Um, Brian, uh, Finance Committee. Okay. Finance Committee met on the uh, 25th of October. We covered uh, three things. First was the uh, levy that was passed by the board in subsequent uh, board meeting. The second was the financial forecast for the next three years. Um, so we have a lot of work to do there, and we're having a uh, board meeting to discuss that, a special board meeting that, that's going to be posted as a, uh, a meeting. And then uh, reviewed our, our first quarter financials, and we're on track in terms of our budget for uh, this year. Any questions for Brian from the Finance Committee? Okay. Uh, next on the list, uh, Learning and Program <coughs> Development. And I am pulling up the agenda for that committee which met um, on the 25th of October, and we had four items on the agenda. Um, uh, Corey McIntyre took the committee through an update on the work that <coughs> his team has been engaged in around providing um, uh, services to our gifted and talented students in the district. Um, we did spend some time and approved a pilot for use, uh, potential use of cell phones 
as a classroom technology tool at the high school level, um, and that pilot will um, take place over the course of the next couple of months, and then we will hear a report from um, the pilot in terms of what appropriate next steps might look like for that. Um, uh, then Corey took us through two additional updates. One was on a system around positive behavior intervention, and the final one was on functional behavior analysis. So are there questions? Madam President? Yes. Can you speak a little bit more about the high school cell phone? I can, um, and then I would ask Sandy to, to fill in the gaps here. Um, from my notes, um, what I have is that um, one of the things that they're exploring, and they are in the exploration phases, but one of the things that they're exploring, if you've ever been in a large group setting where you have um, used an electronic voting device as a way to capture your response to a multiple choice question, um, this is one of the things that they're looking at using the cell phones um, from the students um, as a way to um, create some interaction between the students and the classroom teacher. Um, and uh, one of the things that we heard is that, you know, there are points in time where uh, that is a way to engage students who otherwise would not be comfortable raising their hand and responding in the classroom. And so, again, it's just a pilot, but it is a, a way to try and explore using technology in the classroom. Um, Let's see, Sandy, was there an, uh, something, they talked about maybe podcasting um, for language classes um, that where they could use potentially their handheld device for that? Correct, and then the other one would be research, but it's starting out, if you're hearing that word pilot, we're talking like two, two three teachers yeah. trying it out. Right. There would be parent letters going home, students and parents having to sign off so that it's very controlled to start and just check, check out before we move it, roll anything out any further. All right, um, next committee report, facilities and grounds, and Lynn, I think you're gonna take that on Tom's behalf. I am, Madam President. Um, <clears throat> facilities and grounds committee met on Monday, November 1st. There were three items on the agenda. Um, Tim Erickson has covered the middle school construction update, which was on our agenda. We also reviewed additional capital projects for the 2010-2011. Those consisted of roofing projects, secured entrances at the middle school and Hudson Prairie. Um, also, a water infiltration project for the mezzanine at the high school, and then um, additional locker rooms at the middle school due to growth. Questions for Lynn on facilities and grounds? No? Thank you, Lynn. Um, and finally, personnel committee, Mark. Nope. Excuse me. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, the personnel committee met last week. Um, we uh, had three items on our agenda. The first item was um, a revision to policy number 5109, which we approved uh, <clears throat> earlier under the consent items. Um, this was basically some, what I guess I would term some minor uh, revisions to the policy as far as uh, tightening up some of the language. Uh, and this was on the uh, recommendation of our attorney, Mick Waldsberger. Um, next, we uh, had a report from Nancy Sweet on uh, the process for determining staffing additions and uh, reductions. I know many of you are familiar with this anyway. Um, and we just, it was more or less, I guess, in the form of, a, of an update. Uh, I know earlier, I think, when Mary was making reference to this, she termed the uh, system sophisticated, and I would, I would concur. It, it really is a, a very impressive uh, systems type approach. Um, Ms. Sweet and her staff do a continuous monitoring of uh, the personnel and the schedules, uh, getting quarter re reports on class sizes and making adjustments uh, where needed. And um, I have the utmost confidence in, in her, and I think we're on top of that. And uh, lastly, we had uh, a closed session uh, dealing with a uh, confidential employee issue. Any questions on personnel? All right, thank you, Mark. Um, I don't believe there are any citizens' requests to speak. Okay, thanks, Diane. There are none. Um, and so now we are at that point in the agenda where we will adjourn to closed session. We will not be returning to open session. If there is a board member that would uh, like to make the motion that we adjourn to closed session, reading the language from the agenda. Madam Chair, I'll make a motion to adjourn to closed session pursuant to Wisconsin statutes 19.85 parent one parent E for the purpose of deliberating about the sale and or purchase of public properties. Okay, motion by Dan. Second. Second by Lynn, we'll do this by roll call vote. Robson, I. Bell, I. Ternohoy, I. Van Lunen, I. German, I. Kaiserschott, I. We are adjourned to closed session. Thank you.